Bienvenue à la classe de maître du violoniste canadien Kirsten Leong. Aujourd'hui, Kirsten Leong travaillera avec les participants violonistes. Cette classe est donnée dans le cadre de la session 2021 de l'Orchestre de la francophonie. Le violoniste, violoniste canadien Kirsten Leong est considéré comme l'un des meilleurs musiciens et instrumentistes de sa génération. Kirsten a d'abord attiré l'attention internationale en remportant le premier prix junior au concours Menuhin 2010 à Oslo. Après des débuts dans de grands festivals internationaux ainsi que quatre représentations de retour avec l'Oslo Philharmonic, il s'est depuis distingué comme une voix musicale puissante et individuelle, ayant joué dans des lieux tels que le Carnegie Hall Stern Auditorium, Wigmore Hall, l'Auditorium du Louvre et le Centre national des arts du spectacle à Pékin. Solis recherché pour qui la médiation culturelle avec la musique et la pédagogie sont des passions grandissantes, Kirsten Leong est un communicateur naturel sur et en dehors de la scène qui lui permet d'atteindre les jeunes et les mélomanes potentiels avec son art. Kirsten joue sur le violon ex Boer, Guarneri del Jesu, gracieuseté de Canimex. Welcome to the masterclass of Canadian violinist Kirsten Leong. Today, Kirsten will work with the violin players that are participating to the OF 221 season. Canadian violinist Kirsten Leong is quickly emerging as one of the finest musicians and instrumentalists of his generation. Kirsten first gained international attention by winning junior first prize at the Menuhin competition 2010 in Oslo. After subsequent debuts at major international festival, as well as four return performance with the Oslo Philharmonic, he has since distinguished himself as a powerful and individual musical voice, having played in such venues as Carnegie House Stern Auditorium, Wigmore Hall, the Auditorium du Louvre, and the National Center for the Performing Art in Beijing. A sought-after soloist for whom music outreach and pedagogy are growing passions, Kirsten is a natural communicator on and off the stage, reaching young people and potential musical lovers with his heart. Kirsten performs on the ex boer Guarneri del Jesu violin, courtesy of Canimex. L'OF reconnaît l'appui du gouvernement du Canada et emploie Québec et le Montréal. L'OF remercie ses commanditaires, Canimex et Panorama Media. L'OF remercie aussi les fondations suivantes, la Fondation RVC, Fondation Sibila S, le Fonds AIDA de la Fondation Jeunesse Musicale du Canada et la Zeller Family Foundation. The OF acknowledges the Government of Canada support et emploie Québec et le Montréal. The OF would like to thank their private sponsors, Canimex and Panorama Media. The OF would like also to thank the following foundations, RBC Foundation, la Fondation Sibila S, le Fonds AIDA de la Fondation Jeunesse Musicale Canada and the Zeller Family Foundation. Pour suivre nos activités, nous vous invitons à consulter le site web de l'Orchestre de la Francophonie, la page Facebook ainsi que le YouTube canal et le hashtag OF-2021 sur Instagram. To follow us, please consult our website at orchestrefranco.com or Facebook page where you will find our event calendar planned during this 2021 season our YouTube channel, and the hashtag OF-2021 on Instagram. Welcome, Kirsten. It's, your, it's yours now. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be, to be here. Thank you so much to the, uh, the Orchestre de la Francophonie for having me. I had a lot of fun last year as well, and so it's uh, really nice to, to do this again, and to work with some, uh, some wonderful violinists. So yeah, I guess we shall go ahead and just, uh, just go ahead and start with uh, Gabriella. Yeah. Gabriella's gonna play some, some Mozart, I believe. Yeah. Mozart. Why don't you go ahead and just introduce yourself a little bit? Okay, uh, <laughs> I'm Gabby and uh, I'm from Winnipeg, but I'm currently studying at University of Ottawa. Awesome, great. Was our A major, right? Yeah. Awesome.
Good. Beautiful. Yeah, so we stop there. I guess immediately there could be, we could talk a little bit about, um, about sort of the bow arm and how, I guess, uh, we can increase some flexibility in the bow arm. I think that's uh, something that would not only add more options to sort of uh, the kind of musical choices that you can make, but also just to give, I guess, the sound, especially for Mozart, uh, a little bit more air, perhaps a little bit more lightness. I think now you have a really nice solidity of tone. And, you know, there's obviously the bow, you know, it's very good contact with the string. I think now it can also sort of at the extremities of the bow stroke, let's say, at the very beginning and also at the very end, where a lot of the activity is in a way, a lot of the expressive content is, is that we can sort of, uh, we can start to toy around with those areas a little bit more. So right at the beginning, right near the frog at the at the tip, of course, I couldn't really see much of your fingers at when you're when you're sort of at the at the at the tip. But I mean, I can already, let's say we could start just at the very beginning, of course, this is, uh, it's quite a, even though it starts very lyrically for us, it's kind of a surprise after this big orchestral, you know, kind of, uh, lively, energetic opening for us to sort of immediately, you know, to go immediately softer and lyrically and to, but yet it can still have this very sort of a special, um, special effect that can really grab people. So I think like immediately from these three notes alone, from the very, um, immediately from the very first second, if we can sort of grab people, you know, where does this come from? You know, it immediately evokes something. So I think immediately what we could try actually, when it comes to, um, when it comes to, uh, to working on, I guess, the possibilities of a bow stroke. It's like we really engage not only the arm and the wrist, but also the fingers as well. Everything is sort of, and then we start very slow, just as a, just to, let's say to go away from the Mozart for a second, but just when you're doing any kind of slow bow stroke, and then you bow very slowly. And then at the tip, what's important here is that at the very tip, it's very important to, to almost let your body, let your arm, you know, kind of anticipate in terms of using weight. You know, you keep the weight on the bow so that and when you come back here, everything's slow bow. Slow is meant to be a challenge as slow as possible, perhaps. But immediately then you're able to sort of being aware of every single moment in the bow stroke. And then especially at the tip, you keep that weight. But then you also, you know, in order to apply that weight, it's not sort of this sort of uh, an active pressure going on, but a kind of weight. Should we try that once actually? This is sort of the basic building block. Just try it uh, from the frog very slow bow stroke. Yeah, so at the very, so at the, at the middle of the bow stroke, I noticed that it lost a little bit of contact. So it's like almost there was a solid beginning. But then, okay, now you know to be aware of this part. When you get to the middle of the bow where that contact was lost, then you kind of really, you start to think, think of the elbow, for example, when you sort of want to apply that weight, solid contact, just think of the elbow, you know, it doesn't have to be the prettiest sound at first, but just to exaggerate that, especially at the tip, it's almost as, as if you're fighting to keep the same dynamic, you know, not to allow a diminuendo at the... So you get something as consistent, as constant as something as possible.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Try that again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's uncomfortable at first, but yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's already better though. Already better. We can try just one more time perhaps. Yeah. Here, you know what, actually, now that I notice, keep a little bit more, sort of have this, the fingers be firm, but slightly more flexible, you know, at the, at the very beginning, you could sort of like, you know, giving yourself a cushion almost, like a spring action here. Make sure that they're nice and, you know, pliable still, that they sort of keep everything in check, and yet they're still, they're still uh, malleable, you know. Just try that once with uh, just sort of this concentration on the flexibility of the fingers. Yeah, and when you, when you basically, when you begin, it's almost as if what could help, this could be a general rule for any bow stroke that you do, is that you just sort of, you take your time to prepare. If needs be, okay, at first you put the bow on the string, you stay there, you know, you know, take your time again, and then, yeah. Even though, of course, I mean, it may not be sort of the, the cleanest beginning, it's okay, just something good to get used to when it comes to preparation. You know, even if you're off the string, let's say, but you really take your time, same thing if it's on the string, uh, just like basically take a few seconds for yourself before you start that bow stroke. Nice. Yeah. Now at the very, at the second half, second half of the bow, the first half was very good. At the very, at the second half here, now it's when it's, there's always the temptation to lose a little bit of volume or to lose a little bit of density in the sound. Now we really see how much, again, we think of the arm weight here led by the elbow, you know, we fight to keep, just to give your aware, to give yourself awareness of what it takes. Even though, again, sound doesn't matter if it's you know not the nicest sound at first. But as long as you give yourself the awareness, you know, to really at the second half of the bow, really try and keep the same density as you had in the first half. Yeah, better, better. Yeah, you see, this is what 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 this tells us. Let's say in the be when you're trying to play lyrically in any passage. Let's say in this, the very beginning of this Mozart. When you're sustaining something, let's say you want to sustain something that, you know, it takes a lot more, in a way, either both weight or speed or just more bow in general at the tip in order to let's say to get the same power let's say the same density or even the same sort of airiness of tone as we could get here just because there's just a you know there's more weight available to us near the to the frog of course so what does that tell us is that at the very beginning of a bow stroke it's always good to save a little bit more bow you know so that especially, let's say, if it's uh, if you're starting down bow, 
because at the tip we need all the help we can get in terms of weight and in terms of if you want to achieve let's say a constant sense of density in the sound but even if we don't but it's good to have that kind of uh, support or that space amount of bow that we can just have at our disposal you know so for example Like we really focus, when you go back to this adagio, for the very first note, really focus on trying to develop, let's say, develop the sound. Let's just forget about the left hand for a minute, but just to develop the sound in the right hand before you reach, just almost like before you reach halfway, that the sound is immediately, you're already sort of able to get to the kind of core sound that you want to, you know. Okay, I'm there. Now I have all this bow, let's say, to to work with at the end. I can easily just change bow here. Because it's already developed. But you don't have to, because then you have all this bow left over, which you can then use in whatever way to, let's say, add airiness, you know. Develop. You know, you have more bow, then it's just like, it's almost as if you're taking a breath and the breath is not cut short. Is that you can really finish the deep breath because you have all this bow left over, you know? So yeah, we can go back to the to beginning of the, uh, of the adagio just to really, but at the same, the same idea, just slow bow. This is actually a really good way to just work everything in general, like any of the slurs in the Allegro as well. To first of all, just sort of like to, to get that density, but also to always make sure that you're aware of every single moment in the bow stroke, you know, but let's start with the Adagio first, slow bow. Yeah, try this. It's almost as if you're trying to try to sit on the string as much as possible. Just right after slow bow, but you try and sit. You feel your arm pulling. There's almost like this sort of this this um, desire to to just drop down, you know, while still having a slow bow. So there's this resistance going on. So like slow bow because then you can you build all that energy. Just try that once, just on that note. Yeah. You see, now we're exaggerating, of course, the slow bow. Normally, it doesn't have to be that slow, of course, but that's one of the keys in practicing, I find is quite helpful is when you exaggerate certain things, or especially let's say if you want to, to have an awareness of sort of every single part, what the bow is doing at every moment, of course, when you want to, let's say, pay attention to the gesture, whether it's like that, or, you know, any kind of gesture is that you just you just have that awareness and just really slowing down the bow in practice really gives you that awareness it just sort of forces you to be present at every moment so this is what we're doing now it's just basically you know super slow tempo super slow bow two three four one same thing one two Three, four, save, two, three, four, like just like that. Yeah. You can try that just once more.
Yeah, you see. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's absolutely absolutely normal at the beginning because then basically there's certain forces sort of working against each other, you see. It's like we're trying to push up, but then the arm is also trying to weigh it down, slow down the bow, you know, you see. But this is the sort of it reveals let's say certain things in the bow arm that we can work on in terms of steadiness sometimes. And this is this exercise is very good at exposing all those details, you know. Yeah. So now that we have this sort of idea of slow bow, of course, there's that's the first challenge. Now we can actually play around with it a little bit in terms of variations. This would be very helpful, let's say, in the anytime you have, like, of course, the most obvious example would be. You know, this, this, those two um, slurs is that we can really, let's say at the very, we can try something here. It's like here we can start to make patterns. At the very beginning, we can do a little bit of a faster bow speeds with the start, let's say, slow down immediately. And then save bow though. So I didn't save enough. Bow speed, save, slow bow, but then speed. Slow bow and speed. So again, fast, slow, save, fast, slow, save. So it's almost like a you see that yeah and try that just, just speed at the very beginning when you get to the middle or you get just shortly after the beginning then you save slow bow and then you speed up again at the tip yeah. but you leave enough bow for at the tip so we could just try it just with a with a single note for now I just take the you know take the take the A itself. Try that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it's like the very yeah. So it's almost at the at the sort of the little down up action at the tip. So think of it in the there's energy there. So like let's say once you're done, this save bow here, and then bam like that. You see? Yeah. I'll try that once. Yeah, so actually, um, an easier variation of this could be like instead of, let's say, an abrupt change from slow to fast, we could do it gradually. So, for example, we start fast, but then. Alright, start to speed up, slow down, speed up. That's a little bit easier, but it's the same idea. Yeah. Slow down, save. Yeah, speed up a lot more. Exactly, yeah. So this kind of exercise, basically the purpose of this is that at the very beginning of, not only do you have, let's say, or gives you the awareness of different options at the extremities, 
But then, like, say for something like Mozart, where it can be very helpful to just have you immediately, from the very first instance of a note, that you kind of you get the sense of energy, perhaps, if you want it. Or if you want, let's say here, a little bit of, even though it's part of the same slur, but those eighth notes also have a little bit of sparkle, a little bit of, um, of energy, you know. Um, going back to just, there's actually a lot of parallels between, you know, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, you're doing, um, those kind of slurs or you know or, or those kind of um, you know lyrical bits but basically to it's almost as if you're just in practice you really feel out so certain other patterns what this allows you to do so for example this fast slow fast So if you really want to do it, sort of uh, do it really exaggerated. You know, of course, you don't have to do it that that fast, but it's basically it's all about creating. It's like the transfer. What I would say is like the transfer of energy. So it's almost like when we save, you're really conserving, you're really sort of gathering potential energy. And then when you have those little fast little whips you could say that's when you release all the energy and so it's almost as you see and you save both for those extremities just so that you can have that energy um, if you so choose so you know Yeah, so we can try this just now, let's say, um, just watching the time here. Uh, we can try just from the beginning of the adagio. If you're now with this awareness of what goes on, not in the middle of the bow, but what happens at the very beginning and at the end, you know, and that we can really try and sustain for the adagio alone to sustain, to try and really sustain until you feel the weight, as we talked about. Yeah, we could try that. good by the way because now it's almost as if you have a little bit more to spare at the very end for example now when you have the up bow you also anticipate so that you leave a little bit more here so you can really anticipate the the top me you know Try that once more, because it's uh, the bow action is getting really nice and smooth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. The fourth, the fourth finger is always the. But here, it's important to... One tip for the left hand, I would say, in general, is, um, is that when you still, when you practice slow in practice, or, yeah, when you do slow practice, but still when you do, especially when you have, let's say, slightly more awkward or slightly more uncomfortable extensions, or just kind of any motions, that you still try and kind of complete them with a fast speed. You see, so like even if it's a slow tempo, even the bow, it's doing its own thing. It's going slow. But for this, to still be quite fast, you know, to almost as if the you're doing it at the speed at which it's supposed to happen. You know, if you're playing faster, 
or if you're playing at a fast tempo. So that'll be something. It's like fast transitions in the left hand, regardless of what speed you're practicing. It's always good just to, to almost, so that it becomes less of a active placement. You saw like less of this, but more as if just, okay, you're just letting the finger flick itself down or letting your finger drop, you know, and the speed helps with that. So we can try once more. Yeah, it's almost as if you can just stay there and then while you're even vibrating fast yeah it's okay i mean like the first few times you might just sort of oh it might it might miss slightly it might but it's fine you kind of get it you get it after a few tries Yeah. Yeah. So basically that's it. I mean, in terms of the general idea behind these kind of exercises is to build that resistance in the bow arm, like this, this, this efficiency also, you know, cause you're getting, you're trying to get as much as you can quality and density wise in every single part of, you know, even just a short stroke that you have this. Because what does that allow you to do? I mean, like in the, in the context of a piece of music, in the context of a full bow, you know, is that when you're able to, let's say, accomplish certain things within a bow stroke with a shorter amount of bow, then you can leave a lot of other little details. Let's say if you want to taper something, if you want to fill something up, you know, or taper and maintain that airiness. You have a lot more bow to spare for all of that, you know, so that you know, especially when it comes to the down bows where you're going towards the tip. It's almost as if you're saving half the bow. You don't have to save as much for the frog, of course, because there's, you know, you have that automatic support but at the tip especially it's important you know yeah so that's what um yeah that's what i would suggest you to work on just very slow bows and especially be aware of the tip and at the middle where the bow always can have the, the temptation to slide or to, to lose contact but uh yeah thanks so much yeah yeah thank you so much hi james <clears throat> Hi, Carson. You hear me? Uh, yeah. So if I should, uh, yeah. Can you? You can hear me. Perfect. I can hear you perfectly. So yes, introduce yourself. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, so my name is James Watson, and I've just completed my bachelor's in music at the University of Calgary, with a with a minor in linguistics, and and now I'm just uh, enjoying <laughs> the music life, I suppose. Awesome. Yeah. That's uh, that's me. I'll keep it brief. <laughs> <laughs> and what are you gonna play? Uh, I'm going to play uh, the solo violin, Bach, G minor, fugue. Nice. Awesome. Yeah, I'll just take this these headphones off for it. Put them back on later.
We can stop there for yeah, now. Yeah, we can stop there for now. No. <clears throat> oh, were you trying to get my attention for long? No, no, it's fine. It's fine. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. Just a right second. Just plug my headphones. All right. Yeah, so I think uh, basically what we could immediately try, because I know that you're at the tip a lot. Basically, you're playing, you're playing everything quite high up. Which, which can be nice, I mean, but for the chords, it's a little bit more difficult than, you know, we're just a little bit sort of uh, closer to the, the middle of the bow, perhaps, you know. Yeah, and that, that's the first thing I would probably recommend is that we go a little bit lower, we use a little bit the middle of the bow, so that we also have a little bit more cushion, you know. Um, also, when it comes to the chordal the chordal gestures. I think here we can really talk about sort of the anticipation, you know, the, the anticipation movement in the arm, you could say, you know, so that they're less, they're less, it's less like a kind of a pivot from the elbow, like rather the elbow leads all the motions, even if it's just, you know, kind of, um, uh, And then anticipate with the elbow. You see how it drops before. Yeah, we can try that one just very slowly. Um, at the middle of the bow. Really feel the gravity kind of exactly. in the elbow. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, we can try from the beginning, and just be a little bit near the near the middle of the bow. Mm -hmm. those chords it's almost actually a good idea uh, when we practice chords um, 
and we break them down almost to really break them down note by note because then let's say um, we have so we really separate those those chords into their individual three notes but then every single let me see if let me kind of get you get this more on, on camera let's say okay so every single you're already starting to anticipate even though you haven't switched the elbows down and then you switch and you continue the arm just anticipating before you anticipate you see even though the it's almost as if the, the wrist is causing us to uh, to switch quickly from note to note but then the elbow is always maintaining this this constant you know pulling down motion you see <coughs> And then we try to do this in as least, I guess, with as uh, as little bow as possible. So. And then we can gradually speed it up, for example. And then as an extra challenge, then we can do... while always keeping that almost constant sort of roll down this overall gesture in the arm and elbow that leads everything mm -hmm. yeah so we can try that first just individually for now slowly with little bow Okay, so I see. Uh, we're like we're basically we're just training. Right now, like in terms of arm weight, we're yeah, preparing ourselves that way. Exactly. So just basically, like you're just training yourself to almost feel as if you're letting go of the arm. You're just sort of letting it drop. You know, you're letting gravity do its work. You know, even though of course you're you're still controlling the slow bow. Yeah. Exactly. So now try it with as little bow as possible. So each note, try and almost stay by the time before you even reach the top note. You, you stay within the first half of the bow. So. Oh, now I'm halfway. But you see, I'm already at the top note. Yeah, try that. Stay and you realize how much bow you have left over, you know. And so, and now actually, to um, at the next step of this exercise, uh, you have it sort of you do it with little bow, but then you roll it slightly faster. So, but still separate notes, but you roll it slightly faster, but still remain slightly faster this time. It's almost as if you're kind of, even before, as we get to a certain speed, obviously, when we get to a certain speed of rolling the chord, that it's almost as if we can already think about the elbow already having, already sort of in the middle of its motion, sort of, see how it's just naturally pulling the bow down now and creating that motion.
Nice. Okay. Yeah. It's almost as if you, you, you imagine this as a, as a sort of a wave, you know, or as a, as a paintbrush, you could say. It's almost as if this is just leading the motion, the arm falls, follows just naturally this, this motion of this rolling, you know. So that's the way. Now you can try actually. And just leave a little bit of that double stop transition. You know, this is actually a little harder because that it requires you to be a little more conscientious at every moment. But yeah. same same idea with the album. Especially, yeah, exactly. The A and the e. Is that you? That that is where we are tempted to kind of to let the to let the elbow stay, but we continue. We just continue to let it drop. Did you say between A and E. Yeah. The exactly. A, uh, strings. Yeah, especially, especially that one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. Exactly. Now, when we do this exercise now, we can actually try and do the exact same thing, but more realistically near, I guess, in the in the part of the bow that we would actually execute the chord in the fugue. So it would be slightly higher up, for example, here. Yeah. So basically, we try this at the very near near the you know, sort of higher up in the bow. The same idea. Keep the elbow. It's almost as if we almost we let it we let the elbow almost try and touch the you know touch our rib cage here, you know. This as an exaggeration. Yeah, let's try that one. To really feel the gravity. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Oh, that felt good. Yeah. You see that it's immediately sort of this, you know, uh, when the elbow is in place already, when it sort of it has already provided that weight, it just, it creates natural. And you see the E, then we're sort of not in this position where we have to press down. But then we have that weight already and then we can release a little bit more easily. Uh, as, as, as we could. Um, now that we, we have this, we can now try and speed up the roll a little bit more even. Some more? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, I see There you go. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So when you have this, now when you actually, when you do, you do how I, you would usually do the chord in the few. But in every single time, even a knuckle. You can actually try from the very beginning of the of the fugue mm. if you want. Yeah. Start a little okay. bit closer to the middle of the bow. Yeah. Not so close to the tip. In the context of this sort of yeah. 
it's almost as if now when we're doing it slow, but yet we try and speed up the preparation process. So for example, prepare. Roll, elbow down. Again, prepare. You see, because then we can actually, we can, we have a little bit more time than we think in terms of We can try it very slow. All right, stop. Take your time to prepare. All right, take your time a little bit. You can make sure that you're going to anticipate. Same thing here. Stop. Prepare. All at once, just very slow. Try lifting the bow a little bit, like during the preparation. You don't have to stay necessarily on the string. Just take a, a little bit, doesn't have to be too much, but just enough so that the bow skips the strings. And then, you see? Yeah. <laughs> A little bit lower in the bow. I think we're getting a little bit up there again. And then always again this. Take a practice the exaggeration that we can really just accentuate that little vibration, wait a little longer, and then do the thing. Nice. Now we can go from, we'll go back from the to the beginning of the few again, perhaps. Start from the beginning again. I just uh, just go at the regular speed there. Yeah, just go at the regular speed. Hmm. Oh, just a second. Thank you. All right, there we go. They have a little bit more roundness to them also. And they're also, the fact that you're, it's, it's almost as if it has subconsciously worked itself in there, like that preparation. There's a little bit more air in between the chords, you know, where they should be and, you know, the surrounding notes. But what you also find, like when you, when you play, now that you, you've basically been playing a little bit lower than you were at the beginning in the bow, and you immediately have this, a little bit more cushion, you know, available to you. Mm -hmm. And let's say if you were at the very tip, you know, that you had this. But you do a lot more here, basically, because there's just more immediate natural weight available to you so that the subtler muscles, let's say, can concentrate on subtler details kind of thing so but you basically the main idea is that you have this cushion underneath you that's why it's nice to be a little bit yeah a little bit more lower in the bow yeah you just try it from the beginning again
that that really ties into something my my teacher always says where it's like the completion of the motion is is preparation yeah mm-hmm. it's like y'all just getting yourself ready exactly almost it's, a, it's like just always this ever-changing thing it's like this transfer to one motion to another it's all kind of like within the circle when you have you see that's coming up already oh it's coming down already again anticipation up Everything is sort of always fluid, you see. Yeah. So maybe we could try that. Just as an experiment here. When we do the chords, we roll them fast, but with very little bow. So for example. With as little bow as you can. Same preparation though that we had before. It's almost as if you just. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because now what we're doing also is exaggerating. So we're doing we're, we're pushing things to the extreme so that let's say when we actually do the chords, then they're going to be a little more broad and a little broader. A little more bow used is that then you can actually it feels easier because then we're used to doing using very little bow again it's sort of like what we saw with gabby saving bow just to be aware of what's possible you know like within just a short amount of bow what is possible without sacri- without you know sacrificing sound quality in the long run just what can we do with as little bow as possible to just to, to accomplish it? And then when we push out, then immediately we're almost working outwards and it becomes freer. You know, it just gives us that awareness. We start here. We just try that once, just like you know, almost like you start, you start with a little bow, and then you kind of gradually add more bow, add more. Bow. And expand. Yeah, okay. Exactly. See how it's like almost as if if we work in this direction, or if you want to call it expanding, it's almost as if okay, we're, we're working those little. It takes it takes a certain awareness and a certain energy to conserve both, or to accomplish certain things with as little bow as possible. And then by the time we actually expand, it gets easier, obviously, but we don't lose that awareness. That's the thing. We don't we don't lose those sort of subtle awarenesses that. Of, of those things that happen here. They still apply even if you're doing full chords. So try that once more. Just do the yeah, just do the beginning just one last time. Yeah, 
in terms of freeness, it's already it's already much mm. better in terms of just you see everything is now complementing this. The motions are kind of anticipating each other. You know, in terms of the chords, it also happens when you do, let's say, I don't know how much you did it. But you see, like, the elbow is always. Yeah, so basically, whether it's in that passage or whether it's within those chords, is that this is always the source of the, of the motion, of the energy that goes into the bow string. It applies pretty much for whether you're playing you know, you're playing that or you're playing it applies everywhere in pop. So yeah, that's what I would suggest in terms of and also how to work in the practice room as well. Saving bow, separating those notes. It's a great way to just break down buff. And after these kind of exercises when you actually Play pieces for real that, that you feel as if the arm is freer, or that at least things are more in place because you haven't lost that awareness that you got from those from constricting yourself almost. You know, so uh, yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. That was awesome. Thank you. All right. Who's next, actually? Hi, Gerson. It's me, Benjamin. Hi, Benjamin. Do you listen to me? So yeah, I can see you. I can listen to you. Okay. Everything's good. Yeah, introduce yourself. Okay. Sorry? Why don't you introduce yourself? Okay. <laughs> so I am Benjamin. Uh, I am studying uh, um, in Brussels. I am Spanish. And now I am studying in Brussels in the French Conservatory. And, uh, and that's it. <laughs> nice, nice. I used to be in Brussels, or at least near Brussels, for a few years at the, okay. the Chapa okay. Musicale. Yeah. Nice. Reine Elisabeth, uh, this is nice. Yeah. <laughs> so what are you going to play, actually? So uh, I have um, the Sarabanda in, uh, in D minor, mm -hmm. uh, or the um, or and the <laughs> the Mozart in La major. Nice. Um, yeah. So whoever you want. Yeah. Let's. Uh, you know what? Let's just start with the Bach. We can we can cover both if you want. Yeah. But let's okay. start with the Bach for sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> oh. Okay.
great. Beautiful. Beautiful fluid bowing. Okay. When it comes to the chords okay. and, and stuff. I think even that we could push slightly further in terms of uh, um, okay. in terms of to give yourself a little bit more space even when you have, for example. <laughs> Just in between and those like those those bow changes when you have those bow okay. changes that you have a little bit more breath it's almost a little bit more airiness inside so we can actually and how it works i guess we could focus a little bit on just the very beginning of a bow stroke let's say even if it's the beginning of a slur along even if it's up bow or if it's down bow, especially if it's down bow okay. So we just, what we could do is exaggerate at a slower tempo and try to, it's almost as if you're letting your fingers be, be malleable, almost be flexible, but you're also trying to sort of increase as much, develop the sound as much as possible within just a little bit of bow, you see? Because what happens is that we, we develop it earlier. And then after that, we have all this bow afterwards, let's say. You know. So it's almost, almost, it's almost as we're, 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 we're flinging the bow. You see? A lot of the activity happens at the very sort of the, this part of the bow or whatever you start sort of this part of the bow is very important you immediately try and develop the sound because then you have all this bow afterwards perhaps really doesn't matter what you want to do with that last mm -hmm. bit but at least you have it so we could try that once just like again we roll the chord very slowly it's almost as if again this elbow drops down but then we anticipate with the fingers but we use very little bow like that Yeah, exactly. So we're also... Sorry. Yeah, no, no worries, no worries. So basically this... Especially for the bow, for the string crossing. Mm -hmm. Because actually for string crossings, especially if we're concentrating on saving bow, let's say if we're doing this slow exercise, we're trying to save bow, string crossings usually take a little bit more bow than we would think, actually. Just the actual action of it, so... So if we would have rolled that slowly, it would have already taken around this much bow to complete okay. the string crossing. But then, now to take it in the opposite direction, let's say just as an exercise. You see, of course, that is not what we're going to, you know, be usually okay. doing yeah. in Bach. But I mean, aware of every single string crossing even if you want to separate for example if you want to do like for the next chord and then but you're just aware of how much bow the string crossing is actually taking okay. but we try that again just um, okay. slow bow yeah Yes, exactly. And then while we're doing the slow motion, even though of course it's it's hard because it's we're kind of we're just concentrating, it's slow, that's part of the resistance of it. But then we also we just let the arm kind of drop itself. 
you know, like with the elbow, the little, um, this, uh, the elbow just to okay. lead the motion. Yeah. It's almost like a, like a one overall motion. And then the fingers are flexible to kind of to control the string crossing, you see. But this is an overall motion. Yeah, we can try that. Just to let the elbow lead. There you go. Yeah, exactly. So you kind of have this, you, you have this awareness, you feel this resistance, right? Mm -hmm. This re resistance, and yet you're almost just letting the arm kind of go itself. Now, what happens if you actually try and... Okay. Then you, you notice all, when you try and, again, go back to speed or play it how you would usually play it then you would realize you have all this space yeah okay um yeah try try it now with this in mind this this feeling at the very this part of the bow to have that uh, to have that awareness now try it as you would actually play it the okay. beginning of the sarabat yeah Especially the oppo in terms okay. of just because of course Of course it's actually quite if you think about it, it's quite natural for the elbow to for us to just do this. But in order for the top part of the chord to have this bloom, to be able to develop it, we do this. Again that you let the elbow sort of anticipate the motion. Try that. Just again, just very slowly at uh, for once. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Another way we could do, just to give you another example. So when we separate into four distinct notes. So we really try and save as much bow as possible for each of the four at mm. the very tip, like to use as little bow as possible for that. Exactly. Now try and just combine the chord, but still be aware of saving that little bit of bow okay. at the at the yeah, at the tip. Yeah, exactly. Now you're leaving yourself a lot of space for the top, right? Okay. And so now that try not to think about it so much now. It's mm -hmm. just sort of. But basically, it's like working this kind of awareness into your bow arm. It's mm -hmm. like a string crossing, so the efficiency at the very beginning of the bow stroke, at the chord. You know, if you want to do it up bow, then it's like you're just m making yourself aware of the very first few you know, where the string crossings happen, that you can do it efficiently. But now try not to think about it so much. Okay. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, exactly. You see, now it's like it it's almost has this bounce to it, right? It's like you're you're launching the boat this way, bottom, because then you're basically what happens when you save bow. You allow for more space for the sound to develop, so you have you have this sort of cushion feel, you know. So you're giving yourself this cushion, you know. Why don't we just try it even more? Like now we can go on to. Yeah, we can we can continue from there. Yeah, good. You see? Have a little bit more contact. Those string crossings, those string crossings are, are sorry, bow changes. Really? Bow changes are smooth in a way. And then for those chords, of course, when we have to skip a string, again, we can, in practice, almost practice just anticipating but we skip the string a little again contact just to be aware of a little bit more of those bow changes Just to be aware of those, those uh, just have a little bit more contact, perhaps. Um, yeah, just try that once. Yeah, those transitions, those bow changes are already better in terms of in terms of connectivity. Versus one thing, of course, I want to leave some time for the Mozart as well. Um, a practice tip here, I guess. Is that even though, of course, the bow stroke itself is slow, the tempo is slow, that we want to slow it down even more for practice, perhaps. But... This preparation, you see here, becomes fast. We do it as quickly as possible, but without sort of this jerking motion, but we just do it, you see. get that fast transition just to prepare slightly earlier mm. and if you can you know wait a little bit before you start again as a practice tool but yeah. we can try that once and then we can move on to the Mozart Yeah. 
So it's almost as quickly as possible. Just for the right arm alone. Yeah, it's almost as if these little fingers are taking a little bit of this, a little bit of action here, you know, to do, yeah. Doesn't have much, it's, it's like not much is going on in the arm. Very subtle. Yeah, but just to kind of emphasize the speed of that in practice. Mm. Yeah, so that, that basically applies everywhere. I mean, when you have... arm is doing its own thing but then the fingers here are controlling what's subtle you know mm. prepare you see that that's something that we can we can always apply in Bach but uh, yeah uh, do you want to do a little bit of the Mozart before uh, okay yeah okay <laughs> Nice, yeah. We can stop there, I guess, for the sake of time. But uh, nice, no beautiful um, lyrical lines in the beginning. This again, fluid bowing work at you know, at work. I think in Mozart, you know, one thing that's that's always, of course, when people talk about um, Mozart as or when trying to emulate opera. Mm -hmm. So as a, when people say like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna sort of develop some different characters in the music. You know, that's very much a part of you know these concertos or Mozart's music. Mm -hmm. I think uh, you know even before that, I find it's always it's always nice to sort of even to break things down into a basic level, even to categorize, well, basically to break things down into two categories: what you think is a lyrical element, mm -hmm. or what do you think is a rhythmic element. And between those two, then you kind of you, you decide what is what in terms of what uh, what you would like to portray, and then you would accentuate what would make it lyrical slash okay. what it would make it you know one element rhythmic versus one lyrical so i think at the beginning of course even if you have uh, just as a, a general mentality of course this is of course lyrical you know, you know. when you get here you know it's almost as if you're like Mozart was always like was very young when he wrote these concertos. You can kind of mm -hmm. almost imagine that there's a chance that there was this sort of, even though of course, 
you know, the music must be treated like a jewel. It is a jewel. It reveals everything. But at the same time, there is this perhaps this playful irreverence going on, you know, as a young Mozart playing, playing around. When you have, you know, things like, it's almost as if you do things nonchalantly. It's like you just do it because it just comes so naturally. For example, in the middle of a lyrical, mm -hmm. Know. And then, of course, like the contrast between and you see how it goes lyrical, whereas this was could be a slight rhythmical element almost. Okay. And then the rest of it, of course, is is uh, lyrical, and you have. Everything is, of course, energetic. That is more rhythmical. So mm -hmm. here, for example, in contrast to the very beginning where you would like to sustain, you know, these kind of very long, very, okay. um, but then you would have everything from there's this energy in the bone. It's almost as if there's an incisiveness at the very beginning of the stroke. So for example, Everything is, even though you're you're still, or there's almost a sparkle, you see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what I would would say, I guess, when it comes to that, there's a little bit more action here. Is that not just with the arm, but like when you have those little strokes, perhaps you could even save a little bit more bow, like. Instead of, but then, so it becomes more localized to this area, you see, mm -hmm. and of course the fingers are more active, so. So it gives this, there's always this, mm, 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 this sort of energy at the very beginning of a slur, okay. you know, when you get to the allegro. Um, we could try that once actually just the beginning of the let's just take the beginning of the allegro okay Yeah, exactly. So when you have, for example, these kind of gestures in Mozart, there's always this temptation, I find, or at least for me, when you have those slurs, uh, especially when it's by two, we have a tendency to kind of almost subtly separate those two notes in the slur yeah. in the bow. But then I think it's very important in Mozart too. It's like everything comes from the bow. The bow decides the gesture. Mm -hmm. you see? It's like almost like this slur always is one gesture, no matter how many notes are in it. Mm -hmm. And same thing here, uh, when you have Yeah, 
So that's something to, like in Mozart is very, it's like the slur takes just to kind of, to draw out slurs, even if it's, so it kind of, it has this taper to it. It has this gesture to it. I think that's very important. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Why don't we just try just the very beginning of the Allegro, like the fast okay. term. Okay. Just one last time before we, before we have to move on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so basically, like, when you have those, a little bit more finger action. Okay. So it's a little bit more energy just here. You can even sort of, in practice, you can isolate the arm, like to, to almost keep the arm immobile, but then just as an exercise. Yeah, we try that. Exactly, yeah. So just to basically involve the fingers a little bit more in the articulation. So like, because that is actually what gives that little energy at the beginning. Okay. And that's all we need. Okay. You know? So that's, uh, okay. yeah. Uh, that, I think that's all the, the time that we have, but thank okay. you so much. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you so much for playing. So, yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> nice Real to pleasure. Meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you as well. Thank you. Hello. Hi. <laughs> hi. Nice to see you. Introduce yourself. Yes. So, hi, I'm Maria Sofia. I just uh, finished my master's at McGill this year, and I'm staying another year uh, for the GDP, so the graduate diploma in performance, and I'm studying with Guillaume Melançon. Nice. So awesome. And uh, what shall we play today? Beethoven, I guess, right? Yes, the first movement. Awesome. Yeah, I think we can stop there for now. Beautiful. Let me see. Your, your image is a little choppy, but I think we can make do. Um, 
at the very beginning. Yeah, I think we could basically. Now, beautiful long lines in terms of just the bowing. Everything is very solid. What we can try is obviously a lot of this is very, it's very lyrical, obviously. But then we can also try and get, for example, within the beginning of bow strokes, even at the very beginning, when you have this sense of that we we come out of this already inv invoking something, uh, you know, yeah, basically creating the mystery, but also creating the interest at the same time. At the very beginning of each bow strong, there could be this immediately, this energy. It doesn't have to be an, a necessary an accent, but somehow we can cultivate okay. this at the, at the very beginning, even within the gesture of, of sort of the, you know, just to have a little bit more energy at the very beginning of the stroke, you see? Yeah. You can try that. Yeah, good. Exactly, so we can... And then when we go, we get this uh, sforzando here. I'm trying to try and get the get the camera. When we have this, again the bow here is like ways to exaggerate the gesture of it. So without doing what I just did and diminuendoing, of course, right after the sforzando, but we kind of we can do this as in practice as an exaggeration. We can do. Speed, slow, sustain. You see, it's like basically we uh, kind of speed at the very beginning and then slow down, slow down, and then sustain as much as you can until. Yeah, we can try that once just to, that's a way to, I guess, accentuate that for sound or to make it jump out. A little bit more, yeah. Kind of like that, or? Yeah, exactly. So kind of, if we just strip down, let's say we just remove, remove all other elements. Speed a little bit. Sorry, I'm not doing it very well. And of course, the, the key here is like the exaggeration again. It's like to to give ourselves this awareness of what is possible with the as little bow as possible. So what we can do, what kind of foot sound that we can do with very little bow. Sustain. And then sustain. So we're basically trying to create as much resistance as possible. So like the actual release of the sforzando, we exaggerate that, but then the actual sustain right after, we also exaggerate that just to create more resistance. And by that, we gain some awareness of what is actually possible. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, basically, of course, it doesn't what well, we do it in practice it doesn't have to be like we can the sound quality may not be the nicest. It doesn't really matter. But basically, it's all about separating the elements and exaggerating and exaggerating them. 
And then once we get back to actually then it's like, okay, everything has gotten easier or like we're going easier from this, this state of resistance. Yeah. And then we can finally feel as if when we expand, then, okay, I see this is possible. And yet we haven't lost the awareness of just this, the, the kind of, um, the kind of contrast that you can, you know, incite in a bow stroke, you know? Yeah. So we can try that once actually just even here to give a little bit of energy, not only at the beginning of each at the bottom, but at the top as well. You see, so we let the arm just to kind of the arm motion itself naturally give some some emphasis almost just for practice. And then when you get to the top, sustain, save, let go. So you're always saving, saving at the very beginning of each bow stroke as well. Yeah. Good. Yeah, exactly. So now actually we can mix things up. You know, this is the fun of it. We can actually sort of, when we break down elements, we can just vary things up to a very, so now instead of, let's say emphasis on this, now we have emphasis only on the bottom, but then we, when we roll, perhaps we involve a little bit more of the elbow. So, but a smooth transition emphasis roll, and then you see now, it's the opposite of what we did before. Try that. Yeah. No, no, no worries. We can take the time, you can actually take more time if you need so, to, uh, to prepare. So basically, Prepare. Prepare. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So now that basically you have both, you, you see two different options for the beginning. You know, it's just basically like the, 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 the way, I guess, the idea behind working like this is always just putting yourself in different states of resistance. So you're just kind of making yourself aware of every single motion, what's possible, what can be tense, what is a weak spot perhaps, but that you're basically you know so when you actually do the passage and when you stop thinking about that like you know you don't think about that too much but a lot of these me mechanisms i guess or a lot of these processes are still built in you know you don't forget them very easily if you work this way you know like this all of this this fast speed or this sort of sudden contrast, they all, it, it creates a little bit more 
variation in articulation and also gives us more options when it comes to that. So now we can actually try it. We can just try it uh, as if you would normally play it. Uh, just having worked all of this or just keep it in mind, but not don't think about it too much. And then just, uh, you know, yeah. See what you can do with the very beginnings or like if you can excite that, give that bit of excitement at the, at the beginning of each note, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's like basically everything is, it's what you, it's what you imagine, but now it's like kind of, everything is a, is a little bit more, there's a bit more airiness in everything. Like everything just pops out a little, you know, and that's exactly what happens when you kind of, let's say, when you save a little bit more bow for the extremities, when you, when you maybe save a little bit more bow to give a bit more bow to other elements, let's say, then you create a little bit more contrast within everything. Um, now, of course, in all these, it's kind of, it's a nice in practice. While we're ensuring, let's say, a very long sustained, you're always aware of sort of having the core sound at every moment. But in here as well, in the left hand, We engage it, we sort of activate it so that it's almost as if we exaggerate vibrating every single note that there's activity also. Just, you know, at a slower tempo, if you must. But to almost like, to get the feeling that the two, both hands are kind of feeling each other out, you know, and in, in uh, contributing to this incredibly lyrical incredibly you know which of course afterwards you don't have to sustain as much of course but within practice it's always a good good thing so we can try that once and um save as much bow engage the left hand yeah what we can also do is as that also to keep in mind the transitions in the left hand whether it's finger dropping you know whether it's all that to do it slightly faster as if we're doing it full speed even if we're doing it at a slow tempo, because then it's like, it forces us to, for the left hand to think fast, you know, almost. So let me try that once. Yeah, exactly. So you start, you're kind of just activating the left hand, you know, even of course you wouldn't do this as you perform, you would actually perform, you know, you wouldn't do that, of course. But I mean, it's always about sort of so sorry, you're giving yourself options again. It's all about that. Just activating when you're slowing your practice, just to activate everything. And then, uh, now we can try that again. But this time, almost at the very, the, the important thing here, I guess, when we're sustaining long lines, again, at the, the very first part, let's say even less than halfway through, that we really sort of really get the maximum density we can get with, you know, to achieve a nice quality of tone still. But then let's say we play, let's say we, we split it in half, but then 
half of the first half is less than half on the bow and the second half takes up the rest you know so like Okay, let's see, yeah. You see? So it's like, especially on down bows, because what you actually, what actually happens is that you would realize, okay, even though it's not much bow, it doesn't make much of a difference, let's say, between this and, and this, but you end up having so much more bow and therefore so much more air at the, at the tip, you know? And you need it most there, pretty much. You need all the help you can get. So basically, yeah, try that once. Just divide it unevenly. So let's say, you know, most of it is just, uh, you know, yeah, the first half is little bow, second half, just, yeah, more bow. Yeah, good. You see, it's just almost as if, like in practice, we can't we, we conscientiously just just say bow. Oh, so much bow left. Yes, air. And then, of course, when you come here, it's almost as if you provide yourself a cushion. You carve out every single slur. Yeah, but basically this whole... It's like a general rule for everything. Um, yeah. When it comes to just like slurs or when you have a lot, you know, um, especially later on, like... Just give yourself more bow. Just like to save at the very beginning of each slur. Just to save. Especially on down bows, because then you just basically in practice you experiment with how much you can actually accomplish. Or let's say like how you can get the quality you want with as little bow as possible at the very beginning. Just so that you save. And then because for a lot of the air or like the kind of let's say dimension that we can put in sound is very much dependent on the extremities it's very much like we need a lot of bow at the very ends for that or otherwise we can we, we're happily able to you know but it's almost as if when we're when, you know we're done speaking you know that extra bow is for that basically We can do whatever we want with it, but even if you want a crescendo, you have the space for that. If you want to taper, you have more air for that. You know, you see. So it's um yeah. a nice general rule for that. But we we can go back to the um we can do we can do from that passage onwards. Yeah, exactly. So even here, 
Again, tr challenge yourself to kind of almost make use of almost every single milli you know, millimeter of bow. Even here, to give a little bit more attention to the little notes. You know, so it's almost as if you're you're just giving them a little bit more love. It's not as if you're trying to, you know, it's not really that, but I mean, when it comes to just the attention with the little notes, just to give them a little bit of that sparkle, that little energy, you know, and, it, and enough, it's often is just enough to do. Just to activate the left hand a little bit more in those, in those little notes, you know. You can try that one. Yeah, it's almost as if like you take the you take the initiative to sing even like the the most inconvenient notes, you know, like we, we never allow the difficulty of the instrument to dictate what we want to do but we want to just even if it's something difficult we got to overcome it somehow it's like you know so you know yeah just in practice to exaggerate just taking care of those little notes um why don't we just do that one more time just slowly perhaps and then we can do it up to speed Good. Yeah, exactly. Now, of course, we're really sort of concentrating on every single note, of course. But then now we can do it when, you, when we actually do it for real. Yeah, see how, see how different it feels, let's say, when you now do it for real. Like you, you play it as if you, know, you would normally play it. But then you just maintain a little bit more activity for those little notes. You know, give them a little bit more sparkle, a little bit more, a little something, you know? Yeah. But don't pay too much attention. That's the thing. No need to do uh, you just, but at least you worked it into your system. So, yeah, yeah we can go back. We can go back from. Uh, right, yeah. Yeah. Good, yeah. Now I guess the, the, the next step or the, the, the sort of final step is to now just, now that you have this activity in the left hand, you have this awareness, to let the, to let the, the right arm determine, I guess, the, the kind of, um, the gesture, you know? So for example, you just let the right arm lead everything. So for example, So you're almost just letting the letting this dictate the pulse, dictating the phrasing, dictating the tempo, you know, so that the left left hand doesn't dictate it, it just follows along and yet it still maintains this uh, awareness here. Exactly. 
So basically, uh, like all these ideas when it comes to, to Beethoven, especially because we kind of have to make do with almost the most basic of most basic of, uh, of structures, like with scales and arpeggios. But there's so much in there that can be it's almost like, like a sponge that's just full of substance that you can really wring out, you know, when it comes to uh, even, of course, when you have duples, you know, when you have 16th notes. Unlike triplets, which of course are a little bit more freer in nature, but even then, you have this ability to not only sing each note, but then to really just, by working sort of extreme inwards, you know, extreme in, and then you kind of do that. Then you kind of get an idea of what is possible, even though you are constrained by certain rhythmical elements and, and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then I guess even here. You know, there's energy in the arm, but also here as well. It's not here, it's just passive. And this does all the work. No, this is also. You know, you see. So basically, like, um, yeah, just to have that, like, almost this incisiveness at the beginning of each note for Beethoven. You almost get the you, you get the impression that you know things are just you know just waiting to pour out you know or just kind of itching to to get out of the system you know uh you know these these musical statements have to be made and therefore there is this sort of not really urgency but this this kind of like this uh immediate energy that that i associate with beethoven um that even within those long slurs that you know you can it's important and you can cultivate that sub substance that activity you know in the left hand or just by kind of really you know maintaining that that core sound and being having having all those different options in these parts of the bow specifically you know i think that's uh but uh sounds great thank you so much thank you Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Carson, for joining us for a second time. It's a real pleasure. It's a real pleasure. Thank you so much again for, for this uh, for this chance to work with these violinists. It's great, great, great. I think we're we're par our participants are really lucky to have you uh, as a guest faculty. Uh, we truly appreciate your presence. Any anything you would like to uh, um, conclude with? Any like mentions, special thoughts, anything that comes to your mind? Um. Basically, what I would say, well, actually, I would just reiterate, I guess, uh, you know, a general idea is basically when you practice um, that exaggeration is a very good tool when it comes to just, you know, working, working a lot of things. When you break down certain components, I think exaggeration, whether it's, you know, whether it's a mechanical thing or whether you're just kind of, you know, making things deliberately more difficult for yourself, that it's a very interesting way to to unearth some possibilities that you um, that you may not have thought of otherwise or you would have wouldn't have been aware of otherwise so I think that's a that's a really nice thing to to uh, to have in practice and that's also what makes practice fun is like when you're able to let's say break things down to distort to exaggerate but then of course when you come back to actually making music that you have a lot of this you know um, you have a, a lot of these tools or this awareness, this kind of, you know, memory in the muscles and, and the physique, or I guess, to work with. So, yeah, that's what I would say, pretty much. Thank you very much for sharing that. It was a pleasure. And uh, this is what ends today's masterclass. Thank you to all participants, members of the public, and to our guest, Kirsten Leong. And once again, thank you to all of our sponsors. Et c'est ce qui termine la classe de maître d'aujourd'hui. Merci de votre présence publique, participants et tout particulièrement à notre invité, Kirsten Leung. Encore une fois, des remerciements sincères à tous nos commanditaires. Thanks for watching. Merci pour votre présence.